Sick of this repent of your sins right. garbage coming from Baptist preachers. Right. We gave the gospel to a Muslim today, and he said salvation is through repenting of your sins. Did he not say that? We gave the gospel to a Mormon today, and he said salvation is by repenting of your sins. Hey, why are these Baptists teaching the same garbage that the Muslims are teaching, that the Mormons are teaching, that the Catholics are teaching? It's worse. Yeah. But the Bible says we're saved by faith alone. Repenting of your sins is works. If you have to sit there and repent of this sin, or repent, hey, the only thing you have to repent of to be saved is whatever's stopping you from believing in Jesus Christ. And if, you, if your Catholic religion is damning you, you need to repent of that garbage and believe on Christ. You don't have to repent of sin. If you have to repent of sin, none of us is saved. We are all sinners. We die daily. We have to repent every day from the bad things that we do. Or the wrong thoughts that we think. We have to die daily, as Paul said. We've got to take up the cross daily. But salvation is one time. My wife and I, we went to the church service, and like I said before, it was canceled because of choir practice. So we just sat there and just watched the choir practice their, their hymns. Well, one of the hymns that they practiced was Victory in Jesus. This congregation doesn't sing Victory in Jesus. Victory in Jesus teaches repent of your sins, salvation, a works-based salvation. Yeah. So when they pulled up to Psalm, you know, Psalm 295, my heart dropped. And, no, and, and Nail and I, we were just standing there just, just shocked that they were singing this. And I thought to myself, I thought, wow, I came all the way down here to support a repent of your sins pastor who's not even saved, and I'm going to spend 14 days here preaching to, to you know, a, a, a congregation that's not even saved, that's trusting your works. And I was just shaking my head. I was like, wow, we're starting this revival in two days. Well, the next day I'm with uh, Ram Angad, and even though he had heard my gospel presentation seven times, I wanted to make sure that I was not a repent of your sins, you know, a believer. So I said, I told him, I, I said, I, I believe very strongly repent of your sins is a false gospel. It's a works-based salvation. And without missing a beat, he said, amen, brother. He said, if we have to turn from our works, Jesus didn't have to die on the cross. I was like, okay. I said, well, one of the songs you're singing is victory in Jesus. That actually teaches a works-based salvation. That teaches repent of your sins. And he said, well, I had no idea. I'll look into it. So two days later is the first day of the revival, and what did they sing? Right before I walked on the podium? Victory in Jesus. So the next day, I, I tell Nail this, and we got our, you know, we pray to God, saying, God, and, and I was really starting to doubt, you know, him because of his laziness, because I was catching him in his lies, and I was praying to God, saying, God, if this guy's a phony, you know, make it obvious. I don't want to go back to Arizona giving him a good report if this guy's a phony, and if he's a phony, I want to make sure that this congregation is not investing $1,500 a month in his support. That's basically his support was $1,500 a month for he and his family to live comfortably. Now, his ministry, his church's expenses were $600 a month, but his uh, offerings was about $600 a month, so that offset it itself. So in order to support him was about $1,500 a month. Well, that adds up, especially for a church this size. That's $18,000 a year. That's $90,000 every five years. So I'm praying to God, saying, God, if this guy's a fraud, let us know. I'd, I'd hate to see us just dump our money right down the drain. Well, day number two, the revival happens, and I thought it was a good sign. They didn't sing the song. I thought, well, maybe he figured it out. He's not singing it. He believes in you know, faith alone salvation. Day number three rolls around. They don't sing the song again. I'm thinking, great. This might be an answer to prayer. Day number four, I had planned on preaching on repent of your sins heresy. And I was planning on talking about victory in Jesus, and I was going to explain to the congregation, this is why we don't sing it. It's a confusing song. You know, preaches a false gospel and things like that. So I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to educate this congregation. Right before I walk on the podium, what do they sing? <laughs> victory in Jesus. I was shocked. I actually let out a noise like, oh, no. 
because I was genuinely shocked, but then also I'm thinking, this congregation is going to think we're a bunch of three stooges up here. We got the song leader, we have Ram Angad singing this song, and I'm going to rip on it two minutes later. I'm thinking, we're going to look pretty stupid up here. Well, Ram Angad, he heard me say, oh, no. And what's funny is he kind of looked at me, he said, praise God. And I was shocked. I thought, man, that was kind of like a defiant look. That's the first time I've ever seen that look on him. And I thought to myself, I started laughing and saying, he has no idea what I'm going to preach on two minutes ago. <laughs> and I let it rip as hard as I could, and, and I ripped on, on you know, victory in Jesus. He came up to me after the service. He didn't look at me. He tried shaking my hand saying, good sermon. But, you know, you could tell he didn't really like the sermon. So I'm thinking, okay, the ball's in your court. What's going to happen? Day number five rolls around. They sing it again, victory in Jesus. I thought, wow, what do I do? And I kept thinking, you know, what kind of authority do I have down here? Do I have the authority to just demand him not to sing, you know, sing that? And then I started thinking, well, there's a lot of stuff that going on I don't like. I don't like the special music. I don't like the altar calls. I don't like the children's ministry. I don't like how men are holding hands, standing in circles, praying together and so forth. And I don't like this victory in Jesus. So I was thinking, do I have to just tell them to do you know, everything that I don't want to do, and they're probably going to think I'm crazy because that's the way they do church. So I was thinking, do I really have the authority to do that? So I decided, well, I'm just not going to mention anything. I'm just going to, you know, I preach the truth. If he wants to be stupid and, you know, have that song <laughs> sung, let him do that. Well, day number six, let's go, you're on First Kings chapter two. Day number six, I'm face to face with him. I didn't bring up the subject. He said, you know, my song leader, Michael, he came up to me, and he doesn't want to sing victory in Jesus anymore. Amen. He said he's convicted, saying it preaches a false gospel, and he feels it's, it's confusing. He doesn't want to sing that. And he turned to me and said, did you talk to him? He was concerned that I maybe went behind his back and talked to his song leader. And I did not do that. I said, no, I didn't talk to him at all. At all. He, said, he smiled. He said, praise God. The Holy Ghost is working inside of him. <laughs> Hallelujah. Once, but not twice. So here I am on day number six. Ram Angas says, praise God, the Holy Ghost is working inside of him. I'm assuming they're not going to sing the song anymore. What do they do that night? Victory in Jesus. What do they do the seventh day? Victory in Jesus. Day number eight, I'm face to face with Ram Angas. He says the same thing. He says, my song leader, he really doesn't want to sing that song. It's really bothering him. And he said, did you have anything to do with it? Did you talk to him? I said, I didn't talk to him at all. Praise God. The Holy Ghost must work, be working inside of him. Hallelujah. And then he said, well, maybe we should change the lyrics of that song. I said, well, you know, Pastor Anderson, he does a lot of preaching in other churches. He goes to, like, conferences and things like that. And he says when that song is sung, he just yells out real loud where it talks about repenting of your sins, believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. I said, why don't you just change the lyrics to that? So here we are, the two of us singing the song to ourselves. I have a lousy voice. His voice is not that bad. So we're trying to, you know, try to fit in. It worked beautifully. He smiled and said, that's going to work beautifully. We'll train the congregation to sing it right. What did they do that night? He didn't train the congregation. They just sang victory in Jesus. What did they do the next night? Same thing, victory in Jesus. And that's when I realized this guy is just stringing me along. He's trying to keep me happy till day 14, day number 15, when I roll out, Matt Stuckey's going to take over, and he'll pull the same thing with Matt Stuckey. And when Pastor Romero takes over, he'll pull the same thing with Pastor Romero. And I'll imagine when Pastor Anderson came, comes down, he's not going to touch that song at all. He will probably doesn't have the guts to even sing that in front of Pastor Anderson. So now I'm realizing this guy's just stringing me along. And this guy's just for salvation. Yep. So where is that? So here I am. Day number 11 of this revival, I've been there for 25 days. And like I said before, I'm really thinking to myself, if things don't turn around real quick over the next four days, I'm going back to Arizona with an evil report. So right about that time, Pastor Anderson called. And he said, I found some information about Ram Agad. What do you think of him? I said, well, I think he's lazy, doesn't like go soul winning, he's a liar, and he's just stringing me along. And he said, what do you mean stringing along? Well, I told him about victory in Jesus. He said, you need to put a stop to that right now. 
He said, if they try to sing that tonight, you are to stop that church service. You are to tell them, we're not going to sing that song anymore, but we're going to pick another song. Well, I had no problem with that. I'm like 10, <laughs> I'm like 10 feet... I'm like 10 feet from the soundboard. I just have to figure out how to shut this thing off, and then I'll, I'll be happy to, you know, happy to go for it. Well, I didn't want to look like the three stooges again, so I called a Ram Anga, and I said, hey, I talked to Pastor Anderson. We're not singing Victory in Jesus anymore. He said, hey, no problem. About an hour later, Pastor Anderson called me back. He said, we're pulling out. He said he's, li- he's been lying to me. He's been lying to uh, his, uh, you know, his uh, church board, and he's been working behind our backs. And I confronted him with it, and he would not repent of his lies and uh, of his faults. Instead, he got defensive about this victory in Jesus thing. And he said, I didn't bring up victory in Jesus. And he started yelling at me, saying, you have no authority to tell me what songs to sing in my church. And he said, you're pulling out. And I said, no problem. Let's go to Genesis chapter 50. Genesis chapter 50, you say, well, it doesn't sound like it was a real good stay. It doesn't sound like you guys accomplished a whole lot. Well, first of all, we did accomplish a whole lot. First of all, we figured out we were funding a false prophet. We were funding a bad missionary. So we figured out, you know, he's a bad missionary. So now we're basically saving $90,000 over the next five years. Don't give your life to Christ. Just say, I gave my life for you. Amen. And you're just supposed to believe that. That's right. You're supposed to trust that. And yet these people have perverted the gospel to give your life to Christ. Right. No, he gave his life for when John had first preached before his coming, talking about Jesus Christ, the baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. And as John fulfilled his course, he said, Whom think ye that I am? I am not he. But behold, there cometh one after me whose shoes of his feet I am not worthy to loose. Men and brethren, children of the stock of Abraham, and whosoever among you feareth God, to you is the word of this salvation sent. Now, when he says that John preached the baptism of repentance, keep your finger there, go to Acts 19. Acts chapter 19, you're in chapter 13. See, there's a false doctrine today that that we're always faced with where people try to say that in order to be saved, you have to repent of your sins. You know. Now, that phrase is never found in the Bible. And when you ask someone to show you that in the Bible, you know, you'll say to them, hey, show me in the Bible where I have to repent of my sins to be saved. What they'll do is they'll take you to tons of verses that say repent, but conveniently they don't say the words repent of your sins. They just say repent. So the word repent doesn't mean repent of your sins because there are actually uh, 46 verses in the, I'm sorry, 36 times in the Bible the verses are talking about God repenting. Out of all the mentions, I think 105 verses that mention repentance, 36 of them mention God repenting. Of course, if you're reading the NIV, New King James, ESV, or any other of these modern versions, they completely take out God repenting because they want to prop up this false doctrine. They take out Judas Iscariot repenting. They take out Paul repenting when he decided he was going to write a letter and then change his mind about it. You know, They take that out. And they try to say, well, every time the Bible says repent, it means repent of your sins. Well, that's a lie. And so whenever somebody's trying to show you a scripture on this, make sure it actually says of your sins. And then guess what? It won't be there because there's no such verse. So when the Bible's talking about repentance, it's just talking about some kind of a change. Okay? Now, that change could be a change in what you believe. It could be a change of mind. It could be a change of action. It could be all manner of different things. You have to read the context to figure out what is changing. Okay? There are people who are lukewarm in Revelation 3. They needed to change. So what needed to change? The fact that they were lukewarm. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, they're worshiping idols. They needed to change and worship the true and living God, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now look at Acts chapter 19 and we can figure out the context of the baptism of repentance. Look at Acts 19.4. It says, Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance. So we see that exact statement there, the baptism of repentance that we saw back in Acts 13. And by comparing spiritual with spiritual, we can see what that baptism of repentance was. It says he baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should repent of their sins and start living a a Christian life. No. He says, he preached the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him, which should come after him. 
that is on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Back to Acts 13. And so sometimes repentance could be talking about turning from a sin. But whenever it's talking about salvation, it's always talking about changing what you believe. And if it's not talking about changing what you believe, then it's not talking about salvation. Because the only thing that has to change in order for you to get saved is your faith, your belief. Not your lifestyle. Because if your life had to change in order for you to get saved, that would be salvation by works. You know, if you had to make some change in your actions and change in your lifestyle, that would be salvation by works. But if it's just believing on Christ, well, that's by faith. And so if a person is not saved, Something has to change. And that something is what they believe. I mean, it's pretty simple to understand. It's not hard to see. If somebody is Islamic, something's going to have to change. You know, they're going to have to believe on Jesus Christ and forsake that false religion. Right. If somebody's a Catholic, you know, they're trusting in their works to save them. That's going to have to change. And they're going to have to change from that and put all their faith on the Lord Jesus Christ in order to be saved. And by the way, when you're out soul winning, if you knock on a door and you preach unto that person... And when you leave the door, that person still believes the same thing that they believed when you got there. That person didn't get saved. Mm -hmm. yeah. Either one of two things is true. Either they were already saved, or they're still not saved. You know, the Bible's really clear on salvation. It's not based on how good you are. A lot of people think they're pretty good, you know, and yeah, they're going to get to heaven because they're pretty good. But the Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Bible says, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. I'm not righteous, you're not righteous, and if it were our goodness that would get us into heaven, none of us would be going. Because the Bible even says in Revelation 21, 8, it says, but the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and sorcerers and whoremongers and idolaters, and listen to this, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. I've lied before. Everybody's lied before. So we've all sinned, and we've done stuff worse than lying, let's face it. We all deserve hell. But the Bible says, but God commanded his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And so Jesus Christ, because he loves us, came to this earth. The Bible says he was God manifest in the flesh. God basically took on human form. He lived a sinless life. He did not commit any sin. And, of course, they beat him and spit on him and, and nailed him to the cross. The Bible says that when he was on that cross, he himself bare our sins in his own body on the tree. So every sin you've ever done, every sin I've ever done, it was as if Jesus had done it. He was being punished for our sins. And then, of course, they took his body when he died. They took his body and buried it in the tomb. And his soul went down to hell for three days and three nights, Acts 2.31. Three days later, he rose again from the dead. He showed unto the disciples the holes in his hands. And the Bible's really clear that Jesus did die for everybody. It says that he died not for our sins only, but also for the sins of the whole world. But there's something that we must do to be saved. The Bible says, it has that question in Acts 16, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. And that's it. He didn't say join a church and you'll be saved, get baptized and you'll be saved, live a good life and you'll be saved, repent of all your sins and you'll be saved. No, he said believe. And even the most famous verse in the whole Bible that's written on the bottom, I mean the, the reference is written on the bottom of the cup at In-N-Out Burger. I mean it's so famous. Everybody's heard of it, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And everlasting means everlasting, means forever. And Jesus said, I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. The Bible says in John 6, 47, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me hath everlasting life. So if you believe on Jesus Christ, the Bible says you have everlasting life. You're going to live forever. You can't lose your salvation. It's eternal. It's everlasting. Once you're saved, once you believe on him, you're saved forever. And no matter what, you can never lose your salvation. Even if I were to go out and commit some awful sin, God will punish me for it on this earth. If I went out and killed somebody today, you know, God's going to make sure I get punished. I'm going to prison or, or far worse or the death penalty. Whatever this earth punishes me, and God's going to make sure I get punished even more. But I'm not going to hell. There's nothing I can do to go to hell because I'm saved. And if I went to hell, God lied because he promised that whoever believeth in him has everlasting life. 
And he said, whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. That's why there are a lot of examples of people in the Bible who did some really bad stuff, yet they made it to heaven. How? Because they were so good? No, it's because they believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. Their sins are forgiven. Other people who may have lived a better life in the world's eyes, or maybe even really they lived a better life, they don't believe in Christ. They're going to have to go to hell to be punished for their sins. And let me just close on this one thought. One thing that I wanted to be sure and bring up today is that there was a question that was asked to Jesus by one of his disciples. And that question was this, are there few that be saved? That's a good question, right? I mean, are most people saved? Or is it few that are saved? Now, who here thinks that most people are going to heaven? Most people in this world are going to heaven. Yeah, guess what the answer was? He said, in Matthew 7, for example, he said, enter ye in at the straight gate. He said, because wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat, because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. And then he went on to say this. He said, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. And so you see, there are people out there. First of all, the majority of this world doesn't even claim to believe in Jesus. Thankfully, the majority of this classroom claims to believe in Jesus. Okay, But the majority of the world does not claim to believe in Jesus. But God warned that even amongst those who claim to believe in Jesus, even amongst those that call him Lord, many will be saying to him, "What? Are, all our, we did all these wonderful works. Why aren't we saved? He's going to say, depart from me. I never you. That's, why, that's because salvation is not by works. And if you're trusting your own works to save you, if you think you're going to heaven because you've been baptized, or if you think you, well, I think you have to live a good life. I think you have to keep the commandments to be saved. I think you have to go to church. I think you got to, you know, turn from your sins. You know, if you're trusting in your works, Jesus is going to say to you one day, depart from me. I never knew you. You have to have all your faith in what he did. You have to put your faith in what Jesus did on the cross when he died for you, he's buried and rose again. That's your ticket into heaven. If you're trusting all the things, oh, I'm going to heaven because I'm such a good Christian and I do all these wonderful things. He's going to say, depart from me. And notice what he said. Depart from me, I never knew you. Not I used to know you. Because once he knows you, remember I mentioned this earlier, it's everlasting, it's eternal. Once he knows you, you're saved forever. But he's going to say, depart from me, I never knew you. Because if you go to hell, it's because he never knew you. Because once he knows you, he knows you. It's just like my children will always be my children. You know, when you're born again, when you're his child, you'll always be his child. You may be the black sheep of the family. You know, you may be uh, somebody who gets disciplined by God heavily on this earth. You can screw up your life down here, but you can't screw that up. You know, you're saved. It's a done deal. And so that's the main thing that I wanted to present to you about the end times. And we do have just a few minutes for uh, questions about either uh, salvation or about the end times.